From the studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles, this is Uprising and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It's Wednesday, July 22nd, 2015. Anti-Latino racist rhetoric is on the rise and politicians are making hay out of recent events. We'll turn to the National Day Labor Organizing Network for more. And the group Debt Collective, which emerged out of the Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street movement, is offering an innovative and yet simple idea to fund a public higher education for all. We'll go live to New Orleans to get details on the plan. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Courtney Morris. She's an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Sonali. The U.S. has confirmed that it has killed a top leader of an al-Qaeda splinter group earlier this month. Pentagon spokesperson Jeff Davis announced in a press briefing yesterday that, they, that a U.S. airstrike in northwestern Syria on July 8th resulted in the death of a man named Mohsin al-Fadli. Al-Fadli was a leader of the Khorasan group, about which little is known in the U.S., and he was, according to the BBC, a confidant of Osama bin Laden and one of the few al-Qaeda members to receive advance warning of the uh, September 11th attacks. The Christian Science Monitor described the group as tasked with planning attacks on the West. Khorasan is apparently made up of veteran jihadi fighters from Afghanistan and Pakistan. Well, Courtney, it seems as though the U.S.'s aims in Syria are constantly changing. Uh, this uh, group that was targeted is not ISIS, but ISIS was supposed to be the reason the U.S. started airstrikes on Syria, right? Yes, I mean, you know, I think what we're seeing in Syria is that the Obama administration is really scrambling um, to create a coherent foreign policy um, as it pertains to Syria. And I think, you know, the situation is one in which the search for reliable allies on the ground um, has really yielded nothing. And so every time the Obama administration needs to um, change course in Syria, it comes up with a new set of justifications for why it's doing so. So, you know, in the first case, we hear that we have to go into Syria and we have to arm pro-democracy Syrian rebels against um, Bashar al-Assad. Um, and his use of chemical weapons on his own on his own citizens, and then when it turns out that those pro, that those pro democracy rebels are perhaps not uh, the ideal allies that we had hoped for, and we change course, then the you know the sort of the threat of the Coruscant group, which uh, you know I think about Glenn Greenwald's article uh, series of articles last summer in the Intercept talking about this you know the Coruscant group as a group that no one had ever heard of that kind of came out of nowhere that was supposedly more dangerous than ISIS, and yet in the past year we've heard nothing. Um, about this group, and now that that narrative seems to be returning again. So I think, uh, you know, it's very important to sort of take all of these reports with a grain of salt, because, uh, you know, when we when we see the, the the actions of the Obama administration in Syria, it really uh, what we find is that it's it's uh, there's a strategy of creating new rationales for whatever course of action we choose to take uh, based on what suits the the interests of the Obama administration at any given time. So. And here in the United States, Texas has released the dash cam footage of a state trooper named Brian and Sania confronting Sandra Bland. After pulling her over in her car, Bland, an African-American woman, was found dead in her cell three days after she was arrested. And authorities initially said she committed suicide, but activists and her family members have demanded answers. Her death is now being investigated as a murder. The released video of her arrest shows Mr. Ensenia threatening to, quote, light her up with his taser after she refused to put out her cigarette. Some media outlets contend that the footage has been edited, but Texas authorities are claiming that it was simply a technical glitch and that there was no intentional editing. The video of the arrest generated an outpouring of anger on social media over what seemed to be an unnecessary and violent arrest rest. Now, Courtney, watching that video made me very angry. What was your reaction? Um, you know, I'm in Texas right now, Sonali actually visiting my family. And mm -hmm. so watching this video was particularly distressing and frustrating since I've been driving by myself um, all over the state this week. Wow. Um, and, you know, I watching the video, my preliminary viewing of it, I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to believe that this video wasn't doctored in some way. At one point, you see uh, after Ms. Bland has been arrested, you see a tow truck pull up, the, off the driver comes out of the tow truck, and then, uh, you know, two seconds later, you see the driver come out of the tow truck again. Uh, but you never saw him return to the truck. And, you know, I think what we're seeing here, this is so similar to so many cases where video footage has really proven to kind of uh, 
you know, to really shape the tide, you know, really change the tide of public opinion on a particular case, you know, where we what we're seeing is black civilians who are being arrested and brutalized by the police, essentially for talking back and mouthing off, right? Not for breaking any laws, not for misbehaving in any legal way, but for talking back. Um, and so when you look at the video, even as flawed as it is, you know, you really see um, how at every point in the encounter, the state trooper escalated the situation in a way that was both unnecessary and ultimately irresponsible and has and right. created the situation where Ms. Bland was incarcerated and died in custody. So this right. is it's a horrifying and, and very troubling revelation. And finally, in the wake of the Chattanooga, Tennessee shootings of military personnel, groups of armed Americans have apparently decided to take it upon themselves to protect recruitment centers in various parts of the U.S. Military recruiters are not permitted to carry weapons. One man who openly carried his 9mm handgun in Columbus, Ohio, across the street from a recruitment center, told AP, we're here to serve and protect. What the government won't do, we will do. The group Oath Keepers, which is considered a hate group, put out a call on its website on Tuesday for armed Americans to guard centers. The U.S. government has not assessed any immediate threat to such centers. Corky, what do you make of this protection these folks say they're providing? I mean, can you imagine if armed people of color followed police around to make sure they don't kill more unarmed civilians? Well, uh, you know, at one point, people of color did, in fact, do mm -hmm. just that. And if we think about the history of the Black Panther Party, you could see how well that went over with the federal government. Um, it, it didn't play out well at all. But I think, you know, really what we're seeing here is this, this kind of how deeply ingrained this vigilante attitude um, that, uh, that justifies uh, armed civilians, largely um, white civilians, taking the law into their own hands when they feel that the federal government is not um, moving swiftly enough or in the way that they would like it to move to deal with their concerns around security, safety, uh, terrorism, those sorts of issues. And uh, it's, it's, it is, uh, it's, it's ironic how, uh, how the federal government's response to these, uh, these sort of vigilante actions has really been to treat these groups with kid gloves, groups who are hate, you know, who have right. a history of being hate groups. They've not gone after them and told right. them, take your guns and go home. Courtney, thanks as always for joining us. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye, Sonal. Courtney Morris is an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. This is Uprising. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Family members of Kate Steinle testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday to address crime and safety issues regarding undocumented immigration. Steinle was tragically killed on July 1st in San Francisco, allegedly by an undocumented immigrant from Mexico named Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez. Sanchez is a multiple felon who reportedly re-entered the U.S. without papers several times and was on probation in Texas when the incident happened. In an interview on local television, he claimed he returned to San Francisco because he knew he wouldn't be turned in to immigration authorities. Sanchez's statement has been turned into the focus of a major right-wing media campaign to denounce what are being called sanctuary cities in the U.S. Presidential candidate Donald Trump jumped on the incident to confirm his publicly stated views that undocumented immigrants from Mexico are, quote, rapists and criminals. At stake at the Senate committee hearing is how federal immigration enforcement officials 
interact with local law enforcement. Joining me in studio today are Claudia Bautista, Regional Campaign Coordinator of the National Day Labor Organizing Network, and Marcela Hernandez, Deportation Defense Coordinator with the Immigrant Youth Coalition. Welcome to Uprising, uh, Claudia and Marcela. Hi, thank, thank you, you for having us. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, Claudia, I'd like to start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what the media means and also you know what activists mean when you say sanctuary cities we had last when we covered this issue we had spoken to john avalos who is the author in san francisco he's a city supervisor and he had authored the due process for all ordinance that keeps separate law enforcement from immigration enforcement mm -hmm. um but uh, over and that was in san francisco but overall when you hear the word sanctuary cities what does that really mean um that usually means that um, the local the local um, jurisdiction has created um, a policy for the police or the sheriffs not to turn in immigrants um, or when um, when I request for them to be turned in um, whenever that, that person comes into contact with law enforcement hmm. and so it's it's at the point of contact between law enforcement and the immigrant to not turn them over to immigration authorities yeah if that immigrant is committing an actual crime just as a an law enforcement officer would treat a citizen mm -hmm. that law enforcement officer would deal properly with the immigrant right yes um, there that basically yeah the, the person would follow the same the same um, system in terms of being arrested having a trial um, going to jail if they if if they are found guilty um, and then after that then that's when the the, um, the police department or the sheriff's department makes a decision whether they are gonna um, whether they're going to talk to ICE about this person or not, or whether they're going to turn this person in or not. Mm. Marcela, the, um, what has the fallout been of the coordination, in some places more strong than other places, between immigration and law enforcement? How has that impacted communities here? Yeah, it's, it's been really bad, specifically in Los Angeles, where I grew up. I grew up in a mostly um, immigrant community where we had a lot of checkpoints and actually a lot of mothers who were just taking their children to school would get stopped at checkpoints by police, and police would actually hold them uh, for immigration to come and pick them up. So that was uh, immediate separation of families. And also, uh, I mean, we recently had a case of... I mean, these mothers must have been violent criminals for them to do this? No, and you know, like, um, you know, they were just taking their children to school. And for us, even, um, we know that communities of color are hyper-criminalized. So even when people do have, uh, you know, criminal records, uh, we are, you know, I think we've seen a shift in the criminal justice reform system, right? We want to focus more on rehabilitation. When people are turned over uh, to immigration, the community distrust the police, you know, already. And like when they know they're collaborating with immigration, they distrust them even more. And we know that um, for them to be detained and then deported is double punishment for our communities instead of really focusing on the root causes of the problem where, you know, maybe we need more re rehabilitation mm -hmm. problems. But yeah, that's what we've been seeing. Like, and also a lot of people that were serving their time in jail were held up to like 48 hours after they were supposed to be released and that was a violation of their constitutional rights, false um, imprisonment. So that was one of the fallouts of, you know, local police collaborating with immigration that mm -hmm. it really, you know, impacts families that are just, you know, going on in their every daily life or people that have already served their time in jail. And, and ironically, this is an issue of public safety, right? When we hear the right tackle this issue, to them, um, if we were to simply deport all immigrants, we would have safer cities. However, if immigration is being uh, contacted every time somebody calls, somebody you know gets in contact with the police, doesn't that deter undocumented immigrants from actually calling the police when they see crime happening because they're worried they could get deported? Yes, and that's, oh, that's one of the things that we have been pushing, and that was the reason why in California the Trust Act was enacted. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, when when people are only looking at one side of the issue and um, uh, and the safety of one specific part of the population, they're not thinking about the safety of all of the entire mm -hmm. like um, 
and the entire population. In so city. what happened yesterday at the Senate Judiciary mm -hmm. Committee hearing when the Steinle family testified um, in, in media reports ahead of these uh, this committee hearing, various members of the family sort of gave various answers about how they feel about immigration. And of course, it shouldn't be up to this one family to decide U.S. policy. Mm -hmm. They have suffered a tremendous and horrific loss. But the brother of the late Kate Steinle said he doesn't believe, for example, in building a big wall on the Mexican mm -hmm. border. What did they say to the to the Senate Judiciary Committee? The family? Mm -hmm. um, the, the dad testified just about their daughter and, and how a, a great loss that was. And, and um, we are also, um, we send our condolences to them. Um, but yeah, we, we believe that th although this was a great tragedy, it shouldn't be used to, to push for legislation that would further criminalize immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, is, that are use, they're using this type of legislation, um, you know, to, to push for, for um, yeah, for, for more for more criminalization of criminals, and, and we don't think that's And is right. there a danger of that happening? Could, uh, because of course, as, especially as we head into mm -hmm. a presidential election, these sorts mm -hmm. of issues become amplified in the media. Is there a danger? Even though we know and studies have shown that crime is actually significantly lower mm -hmm. in undocumented communities than it is in the general public, mm -hmm. that s in isolated incidents can be blown out of proportion for political gain. Is there a real danger coming out of the Senate Judiciary Committee um, that, uh, that the, the, what San Francisco, LA, and other cities have done um, could be overturned or derailed? Marcella? Yeah, definitely. I think we've been fighting for you know sanctuary cities and policies that um, would keep you know American communities safe and just all communities safe. Uh, for years and things like this that are blown out of proportion for political gain, uh, you know, take us as, like years back when there was m way more anti-immigrant laws. Um, so I mean, definitely we have seen that a lot of politicians and even ICE is using this instance to push for their own political gain, for their own policies. Um, you know, now after the president in November announced a new national program for undocumented immigrants to get some kind of relief, um, they were. All, they also announced a new enforcement program, PEPCOM. We are still not sure, you know, what that's gonna um, entitle, but we definitely know from the memo they took out that is gonna focus on people that are recent reentries, uh, people that have some kind of uh, criminal uh, history, misdemeanors, felonies, um, and we're just seeing ICE using this to push that program and really uh, push it in in cities where there's a lot of undocumented uh, community members. And the dangers with that program is that that really f uh, fuels people into the, the detention and deportation system. We need to remember that there is a quota of, of 34,000 people need to be detained every day. That's a quota? Uh, that's a national quota that Congress has. Wow. Um, it's a recommendation that 34,000 people need to be detained every day and also um, write that we have had more than 2 million deportations um, in the last few years. So we do think that they are using it um, to further incarcerate people. And like I was said, President Obama a few days ago said that, you know, we really need to fix our criminal justice system that, you know, in per like putting people in prison is not gonna solve problems. So why are we then, uh, you know, pushing a completely opposite legislation for the undocumented community? I think for me, um, you know, dealing with, the, you know, helping a lot of these families in detention and deportation, I do see the undocumented community being fueled now in the new population of people that might be incarcerated in mm. the United States for profit. So, so b with, with criminal justice reform, um, citizens may be less likely to be imprisoned, but immigrants may take their place. That's your worry? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that is definitely my worry. Because, you know, a lot of uh, uh, detention centers are privately run by GEO and CCA, and they make the, a profit out of everybody. And these are the detained. same corporations that run a lot of privately yes. run prisons in the Correct. U.S. Yeah. yeah, if we look at the at the speech that Obama did, like we said last week, he mentioned overcrowding, but um, then there's the, the bad quota and deportation quota for immigrants. He mentioned um, other other prison conditions like um, rape, and we see like trans immigrants being raped every day. He also mentioned... Transgender um, immigrants? Yeah, trans, mm -hmm. transgender immigrants, sorry. Um, he also mentioned um, that the criminalization of drug crimes, but drug crimes are some of the priorities for deportation as well. So this is how we see the double, um, double, um, standards. yeah, double standards in terms of of 
the criminal justice system when it comes to non-citizens. Mm -hmm. And this affects not only undocumented folks, but also anyone with a, um, that is not a citizen that would be legal permanent residents, that would be documented people, that would be anyone with asylum. Now, mm -hmm. hand in hand with these policies and also the kinds of hearings we see in um, Washington, D.C., is the racist rhetoric coming out of a lot of the politicians' mouths. Um, Donald Trump, I, I hesitate to take him seriously, except that a significant portion of Republicans do take him seriously. Mm -hmm. Had a He had a photo op with the very notorious uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio mm -hmm. in Arizona. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, did, he when, when he made anti-Latino comments, anti-Mexican comments, his ratings went up when he criticized John McCain mm -hmm. um, for something less mm -hmm. than he was... Um, I, well, I guess it depends on what your standards are, how you compare those two um, criticisms, but certainly that was something that the Republicans thought was unacceptable. Uh -huh. How important is it to pay attention to the rise in racist rhetoric? And we see this, of course, every four mm -hmm. years when there's a presidential mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. It's very important. I think, like, it's very dangerous as well. Currently, Donald Trump is the person who is setting um, the conversation, and people are falling for it. Um, in, in um, and that that's politicians on the left and politicians on the right. So everyone is falling for it. And it's, and it's very dangerous to have this person be the one that's setting the, the conversation in terms of immigration, right? This is the, the same person that um, last presidential election um, kept pushing for Obama to show his, his certificate. He's a and, birther, yeah. Yeah, and this, this, this time around, um, once again, he's... he's the one creating the conversation and 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 pushing it, um, the entire conversation to the right. Mm. And of course, there uh, the the media are um, complicit in this. There were a couple of studies uh, in the last few days mm -hmm. alone that showed um, how unrepresentative the media is of. Uh, diverse populations in California now as of July mm -hmm. Latinos are the majority in this state mm -hmm. surpassing whites and mm -hmm. yet um, fairness and accuracy in reporting are fair studied commentators on NPR shows like Morning Edition and All Things Considered for the first five months of this year and what they found was not a single Latino voice among them these are regular commentators almost mm -hmm. all white and male uh, mm -hmm. one African American um, and you know a handful of white women no women of color mm -hmm. and then Media Matters for America studied Sunday news shows and found that Latinos made up just 4% of guests in the first few months of 2015. This is a drop of 42% from the last few months of 2014. So somehow in the, the first few months of this year compared mm -hmm. to the last few months of 2014, 42% drop in Latino representation on Sunday news shows. How does that lack of media representation feed into the racism, feed into these policies? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um you know, one of the reasons um, we are here today is also right to uh, share with the audience that actually today we are hosting a town hall where um, families who have been affected by detention and deportation and collaboration between local law enforcement and ICE, how they're being affected, how uh, their families have been torn apart. Uh, because we do see that misrepresentation even in the hearings uh, at the sheriff's meetings. Uh, we see that advocacy groups and families that have, you know, on the other side have been invited, but not families who have been directly impacted by this issue. Um, so for us, we do want to highlight those, you know, we are aiming to highlight those those families that are on the other side of the issue that are being affected every day and being torn apart and definitely, uh, you know, creating our own press conferences and media because we have definitely see a lot of anti-immigrant media coverage, but not enough from the other side. So we do see how that's really affecting the national discourse, not really giving an opportunity for that other side or the families, Im undocumented immigrant families to share their stories. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to add Yeah, like, like she said, we saw it at the, at the judiciary um, commission meeting yesterday where, you know, they had all the, the families of people who had been um, killed by undocumented immigrants, yet they didn't have one single family whose family would be separated due to these, like, new policies that they're talking about. And not to mention undocumented immigrants themselves killed. I mean, yeah. recently the news came out of these unbelievably horrific mass graves of undocumented mm -hmm. immigrants in Texas on the border. Mm -hmm. Where are the hearings on that? Exactly. No, yes. Yes. Yeah, and I see that's, you know, I think um, when we think about detention and deportation, when people are deported, uh, they do run the risk of being kidnapped or, or being killed, um, either, you know, because 
of how different conditions are in different countries. Um, and specifically for us, we're mostly concerned about the most vulnerable populations. Um, one of the things that uh, for the new enforcement priority program, they really criminalize people that are just coming into the country. And we do see a, a small population of uh, queer and trans immigrants coming here seeking asylum. So they would be highly criminalized. And for those folks, uh, for them to return to their country of origin could be a death sentence. And like you said, we had instances of Border Patrol also abusing their power um, and abusing immigrants and, you know, even killing immigrants. Um, so it is a big concern that as a side, yeah, like you're saying, that is not being heard. Mm. So these, all of these issues taken together um, points to a community that has been under siege now for, for a few decades at least, mm -hmm. um, certainly under President Obama and very much so, of course, under President Bush, although Obama in the number of deportations has exceeded Bush, um, but yet he has also made available some limited programs for people to get some temporary relief from deportation, not citizenship or not even mm -hmm. a path mm -hmm. to citizenship, but temporary relief from deportation. Um, in the last... Um, several months or so, President Obama has seemed to shed some of his um, reluctance at pandering to the right and even the center on some issues in the margins. He seems to be taking bolder steps. He also had been more responsive to um, the activism of dream activists, etc. Do you expect or hope in the, in the last year and a half of his tenure that some of that boldness uh, that he showed on criminal justice, at least rhetoric-wise, may play out on justice for la the Latino community and undocumented immigrants? Are I, there any indications? Yeah, I mean, I think that, like you mentioned, a lot of um, the, a lot of him doing this kind of statements uh, was because the undocumented youth or the undocumented community was pushing a lot. And I think um, it was because of the efforts of, you know, undocumented, uh, activists that, you know, they really push in for that. I really think uh, we are going to keep organizing our communities to keep pushing him. Um, but I think at, at this point, we don't know, uh, as we also call him the deported in chief. Uh, so I think it's really uh, because of the community that he's been pushed. Um, so it's just, I think this, we know, I know for, uh, for sure that the community is going to keep pushing him. Yeah. Uh, and we hope, right, that we do get a good response, but it's really hard to know at this, at this right. point. And also happen. his words on criminal justice, mm -hmm. as uh, we're seeing with other politicians, is the result of people's activism pushing them to do something about it. Finally, I'm wondering if the two of you think that there are um, opportunities for collaboration and ties with the Black Lives Matter movement, as we are seeing a surge in mm -hmm. activism from black communities fighting back against police brutality. Um, there certainly are opportunities for common cause, although, of course, each community does get impacted in different ways. Mm -hmm. We are, oh, yes, I mean, we are always seeking to, to do collaboration with any group that, that shares common interests. We, um, different groups within the migrant rights movement have done different collaborations with Black Lives Matter on, on different levels, right? Um, and we, we hope to continue to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's in the best interest of both movements um, and, and we're definitely open and willing to continue that work. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, as at the Immigrant Youth Coalition, we are seeking more partnerships with um, other uh, youth groups that focus uh, on against criminalization of communities of color, against police brutality. And I know at the national, uh, for the national movement against detention and deportations, we actually had uh, Patrice as- Patrice Colors. Uh, yes. Co-founder uh, of Black Lives Matter. Yeah, uh, Google Hangout us uh, at, you know, just about trying to speak about those potential collaborations as we are seeing just, uh, you know, a lot of just communities of color overall being criminalized and being fueled into incarceration. Um, so I think for us, that's the deeper, uh, one of the, the, the deeper dialogues that we're having around all of this anti-immigrant conversations is just really fueling more people of color mm -hmm. into prisons, detention centers. Um, and we don't think that's the right, the answer. That's not going to stop crime. You know, it's yeah. focusing on rehabilitation. But it's also like understanding that, mm -hmm. um, that all these um, all these policies that are criminalizing immigrants also set back the work of those of the of the criminal justice 
um, transformative justice like movement, right. and that's that's what's important to really like notice. Is I want to thank mm -hmm. the two of you so much for yeah. joining us today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Yeah. I guess are Claudia Batista, regional campaign director and coordin campaign coordinator of uh, the National Day of Labor Organizing Network, and Marcela Hernandez, deportation uh, deportation defense coordinator with the Immigrant mm -hmm. Youth Coalition. This is Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. The activist group Debt Collective pulled off a creative prank on Monday to draw attention to the high cost of higher education in the United States. The National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, or NASFA, which represents 20,000 student financial assistance professionals at approximately 3,000 colleges and universities, are meeting in New Orleans this week. And during their meeting, Debt Collective claimed to win NASFA's Big Idea Award, saying that it had come up with a plan to fully fund all higher education institutions in the U.S. The group announced that the total amount of new money necessary would be as little as $15 billion a year. $15 billion is a fraction of 1% of yearly government spending, they said. It is merely a rounding error in the federal budget less than the government currently spends on tax breaks for just 20 corporations. Although Debt Collective did not actually win the award, they are dead serious about their idea of how to publicly fund higher education so that it is free to all. Joining me now live from New Orleans is Anne Larson. She is an organizer with Debt Collective. Welcome to the program, Anne. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Well, first, can you explain the prank that you and your fellow organizers pulled? You, you claimed to have won a real prize? Yes, uh, we did. So NAFSA, the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, as you said, is meeting this week in New Orleans. And there are thousands of financial aid uh, professionals here, including many of the servicers, uh, Sally May, Navient, many of the banks that are invested in student loans like Wells Fargo are here. There's a huge exhibit hall where they're selling their their wares, their technologies, their ideas for collecting uh, student loan payments from us. And so we thought um, that we would come and pay them a visit. Uh, every year at the conference, NAFSA gives an award. They call it the Big Idea Award. And they give it to uh, the person or group that they believe has the most innovative idea for financial aid. Um, and we thought that our idea was pretty innovative and it actually would solve many of the student debt problems that are plaguing millions of Americans. And it's a, a cheap, way, uh, a simple way to fund higher education, and that's simply to make it tuition free. So we uh, staged a creative social media intervention. We created a fake Twitter account using the NASPA, NASPA branding um, to claim our, our prize, to claim that we had won, and we posted uh, on our blogs and other websites uh, congratulating ourselves for our wonderful idea and uh, trying to get the word out about how affordable and how simple it would be to uh, make higher education free for everybody. And of course, if higher education was free for everybody, the folks gathered at NASFA wouldn't have jobs. They wouldn't have jobs, that's right. Uh, but, but more than that, none of the, the huge multinational, multi-billion dollar industries 
uh, Sally May, Navient, Wells Fargo, uh, even investment banks like Goldman Sachs are highly invested in, in the for-profit sector, for-profit college sector in particular. So yes, uh, a lot of people are making a lot of money on this industry. I mean, you know, our, our protest really isn't against the people who just work uh, for wages in the financial aid offices at colleges and universities. Our, our, our real uh, protest target is the industry, is the banks, the investors, and the loan servicers that are really making billions and billions of dollars a year on students. And because we have high default rates, we have people who can't pay these loans, they're essentially making money and trafficking in a lot of human suffering and misery. Now, the mission of NASFA, again, the NASFA stands for the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. Their mission is to advocate for public policies that increase student access and success. How exactly do they go about increasing student access and success? Well, that's a very good question. How they go about it is by giving people loans. So we have, it's a misnomer, right? We, we refer to financial aid as if, it's, as if it's helpful, as if it's actually oftentimes on the panels that are on the program, they, they almost speak of aid as a form of charity, helping low-income students access college, helping people uh, find the best repayment plan for them. And we think that actually, Financial aid is is a loan, and financial aid means debt, and often a lifetime of debt. And there's a little confusion, I think, in the industry. You know, we have to really get down to business and talk about what we really mean when we say financial aid. Many students go into their student financial aid offices expecting to receive assistance because that's what the word aid means. But actually, what they're doing is signing away their financial lives, often, you know, forever. And we think that this industry, which which essentially wouldn't exist if, if that weren't the case, should really be considering some actual, simple, affordable options for providing education to everyone. That's the real kind of aid that we need. Hmm. Now, when you say uh, that, uh, that you and others uh, pulled off this prank, exactly who are you? Can you tell our listeners, I mean, I, I'm saying debt collective, and there's certainly a history to the organization, but the folks who gathered yesterday, including yourself, um, are you all student debtors? Uh, most of us are, but not all. The Debt Collective is, is a kind of new organization. We're just starting out, and our idea is that people in debt should form together, form collectives, uh, and through collective power, we can develop strategies and tactics against creditors. You know, in the 19th century, labor uh, laborers, workers joined together to form unions, and we have that long, proud history. Um, there aren't many labor unions anymore. That that's sort of on decline and in decline, unfortunately. And we think in the age of of of, of finance capital, if you will, a lot of people are in debt. They're in debt for mortgages, health care, and certainly student loans. So in this day and age, it's high time for people in debt to get together to form collectives and to build some collective power against the creditors who right now have all the power against people in debt. Uh, people in debt have really very little, especially in student loans. You can't bankrupt your student loan debt. It will follow you in some cases after death. It really is a draconian industry that is extracting wealth from millions and millions of people, and in many cases not offering much in return. So the Debt Collective says, why don't we get together, build some collective power, and try to find uh, some ways to challenge this system. Now, you know, this is a pilot program. Today in New Orleans, this week in New Orleans, we have student debt strikers from Corinthian College. Corinthian is a now bankrupt for-profit college uh, that that let that led many many students into a predatory debt trap, um, and now they're trying to get out. The Department of Education funded this scam for decades. It's a it's a it's a massive embarrassment to the department as it should be. Uh, we have other students here from uh, two other for-profit colleges, ITT Tech and Arts Institutes, and these are two campuses. They're not in bankruptcy yet. But there certainly may be one day there, the students have experienced many of the same scams uh, that, that Corinthian students experience. They've been defrauded. They've been lied to. They've been robbed. So they're here in New Orleans with us 
joining forces with Corinthian students, we're really growing and expanding the movement. And let's talk about what the proposal actually um, is offering. Your uh, fake prize, uh, your fake winning of the real prize, uh, pointed people to a website, howfartofree.org. And on this is a pretty simple, clearly laid out two-page proposal with some diagrams on it. And you claim that the, that public higher education, or is it just all higher education, could be free for $15 billion a year? Public higher education. Public higher education. All, all two and four year colleges, public colleges in the US could be free for about $15 billion a year. And, and as you mentioned during the introduction, this is just embarrassingly cheap for the federal government that's profiting off student debtors. They could simply provide free higher education for less than 1% of the federal budget. It's, it's a rounding error. It's, it's very little, and we simply need to reorganize our priorities, reorganize our federal spending, and we can get this for everyone. It can be an option that people can have, um, and it's, it's a little astounding that this is not on the table at the NASA conference, that the, the, this industry is not talking about this option. We, we find that a little astounding, and we want to make sure that people know that that option's out there. Hmm. And, you know, higher education that is public, there's a reason it's called public it's supposed to be free and not too long ago it depending on which state you were in was mostly free or uh, you know free enough and now over the years little by little it's become more and more out of reach for students through the so-called um, uh, not just to not tuition but fees right um, so there's still at least in California you don't get charged tuition but if the fees keep increasing all of a sudden you're paying thousands of dollars a year to attend a publicly funded higher education system that you ought to have access to you know the, the only thing holding you back ought to be your grades mm -hmm. exactly I mean <laughs> That's crazy. I it is it's it's madness it's total utter madness i think you know a lot of people especially younger people don't know uh that we had essentially free higher education in the united states for most of the 20th century i'm a graduate of cuny the city university of new york which was tuition free from its founding in the 19th century until 1976. so it's not that long ago that we had free higher education and slowly as you mentioned it's been that 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 benefit that right has been chipped away at and in California the University of California as you mentioned was free or low cost for much of the 20th century we need to rem we need to recover that memory we need to remember that that it's not only possible it already happened and and that we can get that back we need to develop power we need to build power we need to make sure that the option of free higher education is actually on the table you know we're entering a presidential campaign season a very long presidential campaign yeah. season and and we already hear some of the candidates trying to address student debt. They know that it's it's a big concern for students and families, and they're offering a lot of different proposals, a lot of different plans. We hear a lot about things called uh, pay it forward and pays you earn and income-based repayment, all these kind of ideas. And really, these are ideas to, to change the method of payment, to change the frequency of payment, and some in some cases to change the interest rate. I mean, we really just want to say, look, we need to put this option of free higher education, $15 billion a year, that needs to be on the table, it needs to be part of the discussion, and we can't let the, the presidential candidates convince us that the options they're proposing are solutions because they're not. I mean, if they're, the, most of these uh, higher education institutions are state institutions, uh, some of them are city institutions, what are you asking or are you suggesting that the federal government step in to be able to meet the difference that the states can't uh, meet. I mean, there's there's several issues. Uh, admin costs have gone up at state colleges, and so as tuition has risen and professors' pay has dropped, um, the uh, executive pay, if you will, or the equivalent to the executive uh, at the colleges and universities has increased. Um, that's one reason why we're seeing costs go up, which is likely an ideological thing because we're corporatizing the university. But then on the other hand, states are strapped for cash. And so are you saying that federal tax dollars to the tune of $15 billion, less than 1% a year, should basically be distributed to these higher education institutions around the country to make it free? I think that I think that the short answer is is yes. 
But the, the long answer is that it's not quite that simple. We need to rethink how we're funding and financing higher education. For example, as you probably know, in California, uh, you know, the, the federal government has has reduced funding to higher education in the state of California. Uh, the state has reduced funding to higher to the University of California system, and so tuition has gone up. But we also know that administrators at the University of California don't really mind because they can use student tuition dollars to buy and invest in really anything they want. So they can build new campus buildings, they can build a fancy gymnasium, they can create new dorms, whereas money that comes from the federal government uh, that's earmarked for education has to go to instruction. And so you have a system that, you know, the University of California administrators claim that they're not getting the money from the state and the federal government, and that's why they have to raise tuition, but the actual situation is a little bit more complicated. So we need democratic systems in place where we decide to Together, look, we have these institutions, they're public institutions, they're for all of us. How do we want to fund them? Where's the money going to come from? And once we get that money, where does it go? And this is a conversation that most people across the country, and certainly in California, are not being invited to participate in. And that's not what public education is. And it really, we really need to start having that conversation. And also, of course, the issue of funding free higher education, of making higher education free is an ideological issue. Um, because it is so cheap to do this and we're still not doing it suggests it's ideological probably because the U.S. likes to believe that it's some sort of capitalist mecca and that free higher education might uh, just be a little too socialisty, <laughs> you know, even though industrialized countries around the world, man, many poorer countries than us, most countries in fact are poorer than us, uh, if not all, and many do manage to do it anyway. How much of this is ideological, you think? It's a lot of it is ideological. Um, I mean, I, I think the idea is that if you pay for something, you will value it more. And the more you pay for it, the more you will value it. And that somehow, <laughs> that somehow going to college and getting a degree benefits only the recipient of the degree. So if I go and get a bachelor's degree, somehow it just, it's just me that benefits. It makes me more competitive in the marketplace, right? We hear a lot of these neoliberal, uh, you know, references to individual and national competitiveness. And, and actually, we, you know, when we think about education in, in a democracy, one person being educated benefits everyone. It benefits the entire society. A democracy requires an educated population. Uh, as we say in HowFarToFree.org, you know, these institutions really need to be organized in our interest. Right now, the, the, it feels to me like a lot of these schools are working for the rich. They're working in favor of the rich. They give the rich networking skills and, and the education they need to maintain their class status, to reproduce inequality. We need to start saying, who do these institutions serve? And what is the role of education in a democracy? And really start to challenge these individualistic notions that that education is only uh, going to benefit the individual in in some kind of you know um, neoliberal fantasy mm -hmm. that people have. I mean, that's something that we're trying to challenge for sure. As if you might aspire to you know earn only thirty thousand dollars a year if you didn't have debt, whereas if you had debt, you might try a little harder. Uh <laughs> Uh, right, exactly. And as if people who don't go to college for whatever reason somehow deserve to live uh, to live hand to mouth and to have nothing right. and to be poor. I mean, I mean, I think these are we need to rethink our our societal values in in a really fundamental way. And and thinking about the role of higher education is one part of that. Yesterday in our office, we started fantasizing. My uh, my staff and I started fantasizing about what we would go to college for if it was totally free. And you know, and that that really brings up an interesting point because what would free higher education mean for all Americans? It seems as though those, of course, who are born into poverty today would benefit the most. To those who are currently born into wealthy families are the best points to pay the high tuition and get a leg up on the economy, be debt free when they graduate. But if you're poor or barely middle class, higher education simply means a greater debt burden today. And so free higher education would benefit those folks the the most, right? Yes, I think I think, you know, we're in a situation right now in 2015 where for many people going to college actually makes you worse off. Yeah. That's where we are. That's the state of the American dream right now. And that's pretty shocking. And yeah. it's something we should not stand for. One of the things we argue on howfartofree.org is that 
you know, having free higher education is really just the beginning. It doesn't solve every problem, but it gives us a little bit of breathing room, a little bit of space to figure out together collectively, uh, what do we want to use these institutions for? How can we make them serve our interests? How can they be sort of engines of democracy rather than kind of places where you go to get skills so you can, you know, outrun everybody else in, in the, you know, marketplace? And I think free higher ed is really just the beginning of, of asking those more fundamental questions, giving us some breathing room, and 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 trying to understand how education can can serve uh, the, the most people and not just a few at the top. Now, Anne, uh, I want to go back to the action that your organization took earlier this week, yesterday, uh, and t um, on Monday and, and yesterday. Um, first of all, how did NASFA react to the award that uh, you guys claimed for yourself? And I understand you also crashed their private little Mardi Gras parade that, that was organized for them as a conference perk. How did that go? Yes, well, the social media, I think they were confused at first <laughs> because our Twitter handle looked remarkably like theirs. And we, uh, you know, at first had just tweeted some regular conference updates. And then we hit them with our uh, announcement that we had won. And, and they eventually, there were many, many responses, you know, hundreds, even thousands of, of, of people uh, uh, retweeting, commenting, favoriting. Finally, the NASFA organization had to issue a, a statement on Twitter saying the Debt Collective actually hasn't won any awards and, you know, that their Twitter account is fake, right? So they, they had to intervene and, and let their audience know that, that they'd been spoofed. So, so that, that was a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, yesterday we crashed their their Mardi Gras parade. So in here, we're here in New Orleans, and there's a, a big parade culture. And whenever a conference comes to town, uh, they often um, put on a stage a parade and and walk down the front, walk walk through the French Quarter with a big float, a marching band, uh, lots of props. And so we uh, created our own float, our own parade, uh, with our message of free higher education. We had a bunch of uh, screens, television screens uh, that were advertising a fake company and we had people dancing on the street. We passed out flyers and fans. It was very hot so people could fan themselves with a fan and then when you look at the fan it has our message about free higher education on the fan. So we kind of uh, intervened in the parade, uh, stealthily passed out our materials and then at one point we our, our float intersected with their float and we, we uh, we, uh, we chanted, did a little chanting, a little dancing, and spread our message of, of free higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a lot of fun, too. And how did your message get received? Were there individual interactions where some of the individual conference scores sympathized with you, or did they vilify you? For the most part, people were very supportive. I mean, again, this is a lot of the parade attendees are the rank and file, if you will. Yeah. Uh, they, they work in financial aid offices. They probably have student debt themselves or children who do. So privately, many of them came up to us and said they agreed. They liked our proposal. They were interested in talking further. We exchanged a few email addresses and phone numbers. Um, and so I think... You know, we, we do have a lot of support uh, in the rank and file of that industry, and we just have to, uh, you know, join forces, and uh, maybe we can uh, start punching up towards uh, the banks, the servicers, and the big companies that are really profiting from student debt. Yeah, I mean, they're profiting from it. That's their business model. Um, access to education is the sort of bonus from being given a loan, just as the subprime mortgage crisis took place. Getting people, poor people, into homes was the side effect of getting them in debt. Uh, and so to expect these big banks to sort of wean themselves off of uh, what they've come to rely on is going to probably not happen unless they're forced to do it. And so I think your issue of bringing this up in the presidential debates is quite important. Over a year left before the presidential election, very, very long campaign. Do you have more actions planned where you might uh, bring this up? I, I be, and, and in fact, is anybody, say for example, Bernie Sanders bringing this up, bring up the issue of free public higher education? I think, I think Bernie is. I think Bernie's uh, mentioned it and, and raised it as an issue uh, that we should federally you know, fund 
higher education. He's the only one that I've heard. The other candidates uh, are really talking about, uh, there's, a, there's some key words we need to pay attention to that are going to get used a lot during the campaign that are really tricky. Um, Hillary Clinton, for example, has been talking about debt-free college. And this is, this is tricky. It's, it's, uh, that's kind of like universal health care, but not right. free health care. <laughs> What, what they mean by this yeah. is, is these programs, um, pay as you earn is one the Department of Education is, is really promoting right now, income-based repayment, where essentially, you know, you, you would have your wages garnished for decades after college. So you wouldn't sign up for a loan in the same way that we do now, but after, after you leave school or after graduation, you would have your wages garnished for many years. Um, so, for example, we heard uh, presenters in the NASA conference, we heard reports that people at NASA were talking about student debt as a kind of mortgage that you have to pay the rest of your life. So I think, you know, these are the kinds of, pro these are the kind of proposals we're going to hear from presidential candidates. They know they have to address student debt, they know they have to address the exploding cost of college, and they're going to do it by slightly tweaking you know, the repayment options and changing how that happens, but they have no intention of, it, of actually considering what is, again, the simplest and cheapest option, which is to provide free higher education at the cost of $15 billion a year, less than 1% of the federal budget. Why aren't people running for president talking about this? Your guess is as good as mine. Bernie Sanders does indeed have a proposal to make a higher education, public education free. He has introduced the College for All Act that would make four-year public colleges and universities tuition free. So interesting to see the reaction to that U.S. News um, and World Report uh, criticized this, saying that th there's a reason to be skeptical of this idea. Why? Because, quote, free public college would limit choice as many private institutions now trying to compete with a highly subsidized free public option would likely struggle to survive. And so students apparently must carry debt in order to help private institutions compete. Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, to me, private institutions uh, being forced to close sounds like kind of a good thing. I mean, I mean, we have these very expensive private institutions. They often, in the cases of the for-profits, for example, and, and even some very expensive uh, private nonprofit schools, providing very little in terms of, of a real quality education, many diploma mills out there. I mean, what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? We provide free public higher education. We give people that option. I mean, I mean, you know, people who talk about the free market and letting the market decide, I'm not one of those people, but people who do talk that way, uh, what are they afraid of? Uh, that, that's a question I would ask them. Hmm. Well, uh, and give out a website where our audience can uh, dig into the details of your proposal that was put out. You can read our proposal for free higher education at howfartofree.org howfartofree.org, and Debt Collective is also online, I understand, at debtcollective.org. That's right. Which is, of course, an organization that came out of the Occupy Wall Street movement, one of the uh, few burgeoning uh, pieces of that movement that seems to be growing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. My guest is Anne Larson. She is an organizer with Debt Collective. Again, howfartofree.org is the website that she mentioned, as well as debtcollective.org. And that does it for our program today. This is Uprising. Anna Buss is our assistant producer and our technical director. Christian Beck is our production coordinator. Kiana Turner is our visual editor, research intern, and audio engineer, along with Teddy uh, Robinson. Special thanks to Jonathan Alexander for technical assistance. Annie Mendoza is our social media coordinator. Coordinator. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash uprising with Sonali. Our website is uprisingwithsonali.com. Our theme music is by Ketsal. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar, host and executive producer of Uprising. I'll see you next time.